Yeah, welcome back. So before the break, um, we looked at all the important elements that are that make up the salvation experience. All the things which have to be there for the salvation experience to be true. So let's say that a person has genuinely repented. They have genuinely placed their faith in Jesus. So what happens to that person? That person experiences something called regeneration. They are reborn. Uh, they are born again. Those are the different terms that we use to describe what happens to that person when they repent and place their faith in Jesus. Um, so in, when we covered the doctrine of humanity, we talked about ho how we all are spirit beings. All of us sitting over here, we are spirit beings. And we have a soul, that is mind, uh, will, emotions. And we live inside a human body. So we all are spirit beings. What does it say about spirit beings in, uh, in the Bible? John chapter 3, verse 6. John 3, 6. John chapter 3, verse 6. That which is born from flesh, flesh, that which is born from spirit is spirit. Exactly. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. In the, in the NIV it says, flesh gives birth to flesh. So, um, in the in the class we had, you know, uh, when we were doing the doctrine of humanity, we saw that all humans, because of Adam, we are born as fallen, sinful spirit beings. So, a fallen, sp sinful spirit being, when uh, you know, when such people they give birth to children, their children are also fallen, sinful spirit beings because flesh can only give birth to flesh it takes the holy spirit to give birth to something which is of the spirit so uh, all of us we are born as fallen sinful spirit beings um, and what does jesus say about such people in john 3 3 yeah if you could read out john 3 3 John chapter 3 verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless a person is born again, no way are they going to see the kingdom of God. Why? Because all of us, you know, in our past, we were fallen sinful spirit beings. Fallen sinful spirit beings cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Plain fact. They have to be born again. They have to become something else. Only then they're going to get into the kingdom of God. So, so which is what you know Jesus did for us. Um, he had a very permanent solution to this problem. What to do with a fallen sinful person? They cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So God literally killed them, crucified them. It's a very, it's a very permanent solution. Uh, if we were to look at Romans chapter 6, verse 4, what does it say? Romans 6, 4. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So, it, we were literally buried with him through baptism into death. How did God deal with the situation? Where all the people are fallen, sinful spirit beings. They cannot enter into heaven, but God loves them. He wants to bring them into heaven. So what does he do? He crucifies them, literally kills them. Because you see, if you just simply put some new clothes on them, make them look nice, put some makeup on them, they will still not be good enough to enter into heaven because they are still fallen, sinful spirit beings. So permanent solution, he kills them, crucifies them, but then we don't stay dead because it of course says over here, you know, in the same way Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too are raised from the dead that we may live a new life. So in that moment of salvation, he kills us, crucifies us along with Christ, and then with Christ, 
we are raised to a new way of life which is what it talks about in titus chapter 3 verse 5 titus chapter 3 verse 5 Titus chapter three verse five, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us through the washing of uh, regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. How did He save us through the washing of regeneration? Uh, in a, in an I V it says washing of rebirth, and through the renewal by the Holy Spirit. So He, through the divine work of the Holy Spirit. the sinful fallen spirit being was crucified and through the divine work of the holy spirit this person was reborn rebirthed into a new creation and only such new creations will enter into heaven nobody else can enter into heaven um so this process where we are crucified with christ and then through the divine work of the holy spirit we are reborn into a new creation this process is called regeneration or rebirth in simple terms we call it being born again okay so um so one thing that to remember about this regeneration experience is that it happens in instantly in one moment in that second when you make that commitment to the lord jesus and you repent and place your faith in him in that moment regeneration takes place so in the same way a baby when it's born it takes a, it takes a moment for the baby to be born so of course for the mother it will probably feel like one year uh, so you know, the baby is born in an instant but the growth process takes a lifetime we need to remember that so it's not enough to be regenerated and then just sit there like one big fat baby we need to start growing that's part of the growth process uh, otherwise there would be something very wrong with that person if that if that baby never grew up and just continued sitting over there in its diaper it would be a very very serious thing but a lot of christians do that they get regenerated they are reborn and they assume that they have arrived and they just sit there in their diapers it's very very humiliating way to live you know when a little baby you know a little child you know uh, you don't give a chocolate to that child that kid will you know throw a tantrum it will cry it will scream it will protest and everyone thinks the baby is so cute you know i mean uh, even if it's crying and screaming but a 20 year old you don't give him a chocolate and he starts screaming and shouting and you know protesting what will you think it's humiliating and yet we have a lot of believers who are living in that very stunted retarded condition where they have never grown up no spiritual growth at all they behave the same way a little baby would behave and when you, when a baby you know when a person is a new believer you think oh how cute there's there's so many things that they still don't know and you're patient with them you know you you considerate towards them but after 20 years of being a believer if you're still in that same state there's something very disgusting and humiliating about it you know and uh, so it is absolutely important that this person who has become reborn start growing so the lord helps us in this growth process because this is what it says about the new creation thankfully it says this this is what it says second corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 we've read it out many times we are familiar with it so if someone could read out second corinthians 5 17 Second Corinthians chapter five verse seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, and old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It says, if anyone is in Christ, so you see this growing up. You don't have to do it on your own. You don't have to do it in your own strength. Now you are in Christ. You are in a very superior position. Earlier, you were this helpless slave. whatever you know say, uh, satan would make you do you did it you didn't really have a choice but now you are in christ your status is so high you have great power in you to be able to grow to be able to change so this new creation is not living a helpless independent life this new creation is in christ and because we are in christ 
the old has really gone we can actually start living in a new way like it says in roman 64 right we have been raised up so that we can live in a new way a new life so this being in christ this this life that we have in christ uh one teacher uh used an illustration to to bring out this he talks about a bucket and a sponge the bucket is full of water and then you put the sponge into the bucket what happens to the sponge the sponge begins to absorb the water which is inside so as time goes by the sponge becomes more and more full of that water so now the sponge is in the water and the water is in the sponge i'm not saying that the sponge becomes the water the sponge will always stay the sponge and the water will always be water but the water is now gotten into the sponge and the sponge is inside the water completely you know immersed in it our experience as believers should be like that where we are in christ jesus would be the uh, bucket of water and we are the sponge and we allow ourselves to become more and more immersed in him the more immersed we are in him the more we will be able to walk in his power so this union with christ that we have you know we can picture it in this way so this is the interesting thing about the bucket and the sponge whatever the bucket is experiencing the sponge will automatically experience because the sponge is in the bucket right so if you take the bucket and the sponge and put them in a freezer unit you know the water is going to get cold the sponge will also get cold you take the sponge and the and the bucket and you put them in kashmir the bucket will enjoy kashmir the sponge will also enjoy kashmir because they both are together in the same way you know in romans chapter 6 free to pour this is what it says you know just as christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the father we too may live a new life so he begins to live a new life the bucket starts living a new life we the sponge can also live that same new life whatever the bucket is experiencing the sponge can experience it's only the stubborn sponge which refuses to experience it so it's our stubbornness which which stops us from enjoying the new life which we can have in christ on the other hand if a person humbles themselves on a daily basis and says lord i will take up your yoke and learn from you i will take up my cross and learn from you today lord teach me i am willing to listen i am willing to you know obey the lord will begin to teach and you everything that the, that jesus has experiencing in his victory you also will experience the same victory so it's not necessary for us to continue living defeated lives we are in christ if christ is having victory then we also can have victory we are in him we are the sponge inside the bucket so when he is walking in victory we also can walk in victory all that we need to do is be willing to take up his cross and say yes today i will learn from you whatever you are teaching me today i am willing to bend my neck submit and learn main problem with uh, that god had with the israelites were that they were stiff necked they would refuse to bend their neck no they do not want to learn they do not want to yield but then if we are willing to bend our neck and say yes lord i choose to take my cross and submit to you and learn from you then we will begin to experience whatever christ has experienced in his victory so we begin to grow from one level of victory to another so we don't have to live defeated lives now the thing about the bucket and the sponge if you take the bucket and you place it you know on top of a multi storied building right there on top the bucket is in a very high position but the sponge is also in a high position because the sponge is in the bucket so where is christ seated now he is seated in the heavenlies we are in christ so where are we seated spiritually we are also seated in the heavenlies yes in our physical body we are here on this earth but in the spiritual realm we are seated with him why because the sponge is in the bucket you know so whatever the bucket experiences we experience so jesus christ is experiencing authority 
and power. In him, we also can enjoy the same authority and power, which is what it says in the scriptures. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Oh, yeah. If someone could read out Ephesians 2, verse 6. And raised us together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ah, I'm not sure which version that is, but it's so nice. You know, we say we sit, we're raised up together with him, we're seated together with him. Nice, that's a good version. Uh, so um it uh, you know so why were we raised up with Christ? Why didn't Jesus leave us, you know, crucified and dead? He raised us up with Christ so that we can enjoy the status which Jesus is enjoying. So we are seated with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So we can exercise our spiritual authority to walk in victory. We can exercise our spiritual authority to get the things which we need to be able to live on this earth. You know, when it comes to uh, the things we, re we require to survive, you know, finances, maybe a job, uh, you know, uh, health for us and our family, these things, we can exercise our spiritual authority. Why? Because the sponge is in the bucket. If Christ is living in authority and power, we too can have the same authority and power because it's said in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that we are in Christ. The new has come. The old is gone. That old helpless existence is gone. We are now in Christ. You know, we are the new creation. Now for the third aspect, uh, the bucket and the sponge story will not work uh, because buckets and sponges don't grow uh, fruit. So the, for the third example, maybe we would have to take the uh, you know the example of the branch, uh, the, the wine and the branches. So um, the branch chooses to stay in the wine creeper. It chooses to stay attached to the wine creeper. So as long as the branch is attached to the wine creeper, it is able to bear much fruit, uh, which is what you know Jesus says to us uh, in John chapter fifteen, verse four. He says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Okay, so John 15 verse 6 this is the warning which God, Jesus gives. Uh, yeah, if someone could read out John 15 verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. So a person who refuses to, to stay in Christ, they will not bear any kind of spiritual fruit. They will continue to live in sin. They will continue to be defeated. They will not be able to uh, gain the benefits that, that come to us you know, as be a, by being part of the kingdom of God. They'll continue to live defeated lives in every way. So such people, they are not even part of the kingdom. So, you know, they are burnt up. Uh, so Jesus warns and he says, you have to stay in me. The sponge has to make a conscious choice to continue being immersed in the bucket and to become more and more immersed in the bucket. So it's a choice that we need to make from our side. And how do we do that? Simply by taking up our cross taking up the yoke and learning from our gentle and humble teacher on a daily basis. It's, it's, it's basically that. Yes, go ahead. Yoke and uh, cross are two different things. No? It's not the same. Yeah. Now, um, biblically, that word yoke referred to, um, uh, you know, um, they talk about oxen, but that is not what it talks about in that passage because it doesn't talk about us yoking ourselves to Jesus. It says, take my yoke. It doesn't say, I'm yoking myself with you. Okay, so generally the example that is used of oxen, uh, the yoke which connects to oxen, that would not be the correct um, usage of the term yoke. It talks about how they would have this uh, long, uh, you know, pole on their shoulders and then you would carry water on one side and carry water on the other side. So it's basically that yoke. 
so uh, you are so jesus is saying there is a yoke which i want you to carry and uh, so as long as you're carrying that i will be able to teach you so in that sense uh, the yoke and the cross are two learning implements okay, that's all i mean uh, if, you, if, you, if we stretch the yoke example too much, we lose the meaning. If we stretch the cross example also too much, we lose the meaning. It's just basically two ways of saying what I am putting on you, you bear that. Because you see, actually, if you look at that Matthew 11 passage, the very next chapter is talking about the Pharisees and all these wrong burdens, yokes, which they are putting on the people. So they are saying, you know, you, you walk this many kilometers on the Sabbath. Uh, you have to you know, clean yourself ritually in this particular way. You do all these things, then God will be pleased with you. So Jesus is saying, forget their yoke. Don't put on their yoke. Take my yoke. Learn from me. So uh, he has his own way of teaching us. So um, we can think of it as uh, the yoke which we are carrying. Uh, or we can think of it, as, of it as the cross that we are carrying. Both of them are basically... Uh, conveying the point. So yes, I admit what you're saying is true. One is a water carrying uh, yoke. The other is a uh, uh, cross on which people are crucified. But both of them are uh, learning instruments which God is using to teach us submission, to teach us trust. So we, he, he sometimes deprives us of, of something and he says, in spite of me depriving you of this, are you still believing in me? Are you still trusting me? So that becomes a cross in the sense, you know, you, you are now living in suffering, you're sharing in his suffering. But at the same time, it's also that water carrier yoke where you're learning something from him. So, um, yeah, these are all just word pictures which I used. We don't stretch them too far. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so uh, we saw the importance of being attached, of staying attached to the wine creeper so that we will continue to bear uh, fruit. Uh, okay, coming to the next point about justification. So we talked a little bit about salvation. Now we will look at the next concept, which is justification. What exactly is justification? Justification is the judicial declaration. The judge is declaring and he is saying, you are righteous. So justification basically is, God declaring and saying, you are righteous. Salvation, justification, both of them together happen in one single moment. In that one single moment, you are saved. You are delivered from the, from the bondage to sin. You, are, you, are, you enter into a new relationship with him. And in that very moment, he also declares and says, now onwards, you are righteous. So justification and salvation, they go together. They happen in one, in the same moment. And in the same way, salvation is through the grace of God. And when you place your faith in him, in the same way, even justification is also by the grace of God when you place your faith in him. We we'll look at two verses which bring out that point. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Romans chapter 3, verse 24 being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So the justification is happening freely by the grace of God. And uh, Romans 4 verse 3. Romans chapter 4 verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So Abraham chooses to place his faith in God. And that is declared to him as, credited to him as righteousness. So uh, justification comes by grace of God through faith. In the same way, salvation comes by grace of God through faith. Both of, both of them, salvation and justification, happen together in the same instance. But this one important aspect of justification, which you know uh, we need to um, look into, which we need to grasp. Justification covers all of our sins okay so that is an important point that we need to understand when god declares and says now onwards you are righteous you are completely righteous all your sins have been washed away so that's an important uh, doctrinal truth which we need to 
uh, you know, grasp. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. Um, maybe we can look at verses 11 to 14 first. Yeah. Hebrews 10, 11 to 14. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. And every priest uh, stands uh, ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 13. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Verse 14. For by one offering he has perfect, perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Verse 15. But the yeah, Holy no, no, that, yeah, that's enough. Yeah. So, yes. So, um, look at the contrast being made over here between the two priests. One is your human priest and the other is Jesus, the high priest. Look at the contrast between them. In verse 11, you have the human priest standing day after day. On the other hand, Jesus, he makes his sacrifice once and he sits down, which means his work is completed. So the contrast is that this human priest has to go on making animal sacrifices day after day. Every morning, every evening, forever and ever, he has to keep doing that. And, uh, you know, um, if you want the reference for that, that would be Exodus chapter 29, verses 38 to 41. In Exodus 29, 38 to 41 is where God tells them, every morning you have to sacrifice the lamb. Every evening you have to sacrifice the lamb. Only in that way will God's, you know, judgment not come down upon the people. So this is what the priest does every day. He goes and stands over there and he does it again and again and again. Jesus, on the other hand, what does he do? It says, verse 12, but when this priest had offered for all time, okay, he made the sacrifice for all time. When he had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Why? Because this one sacrifice was sufficient, it was enough to cover the sins of all the human beings who lived before the birth of Jesus. You know, even before Jesus came into this world, uh, all the human beings who existed before the time of Jesus, that one sacrifice which he did was enough to cover the sins of all of those people. So all the Old Testament people who had placed their faith in Yahweh and genuinely followed him, that sacrifice became applicable to all of them, to all of their sins. If they had committed, you know, one million uh, and two sins, the sacrifice of Jesus would cover and wash away every one of those one million and two sins. Okay, so, uh, one sacrifice was enough to cover every single sin of every single person before the time of Jesus. All their sins got covered. Uh, so, the, of course, the uh, you know the that sac sacrifice would be applicable only to the true followers of Yahweh. Let's look at just two examples: Genesis chapter six, verse nine. Uh, you know, two popular characters who were declared by Yahweh as His true followers. Uh, Genesis six nine. Genesis chapter six, verse nine. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. It says that Noah was a righteous man. Okay. Um, it, it, it also says that he was blameless among the people of his time. Does it mean he never committed any sin? No, he's blameless in the sense whenever he commits a sin, he immediately goes to the Lord and asks for forgiveness. He repents. It does not continue living in sin. So in that way, he maintains a blameless status in front of God. He doesn't go on wallowing in his sins. He immediately confesses repents. So he was a righteous man who was blameless among the people of his time and he walked faithfully with God. Let's look at Job chapter 1 verse 1. What does it say about Job? Job 1 1. Job chapter 1 verse 1. There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. He feared God and he shunned evil. He, he, he pushed it aside. He did not want to have anything to do with evil. He loved God 
and he and he wanted to you know be blameless and upright now all of these people whenever they would commit a sin what would they do they would immediately go and offer sacrifices in fact job even offered sacrifices on behalf of his children because he was worried you know that his children might have sinned in some way so he made offerings even on behalf of them so all of these people the offerings the animal sacrifices which they made were pointing towards what jesus would do one day so when these faithful righteous people maintained a blameless status with god on a daily basis when they made those sacrifices god looked at those animal sacrifices and connected it with what jesus is going to do in the future and so he atoned for all of their sins so every single sin committed by these people was cleansed when jesus finally made his sacrifice until that time they all had to wait in paradise for the work of the cross to be finished but you know they were covered by the sacrifice of jesus and then from the time that jesus was physically born on this earth right into the future i mean uh, from the uh, you know uh, up to the time that he was uh, resurrected and went back into heaven and all the generations which came after that all of their sins every single one of our, of the sins of all the people who have lived from the time of jesus up to now and into the future their sins also were covered by this one sacrifice so you know the wrong doctrine which some people teach that at the time of salvation all the sins which you have committed up to the time of salvation those are forgiven but then the ones which you are going to commit in the future those are not forgiven wrong doctrine jesus sat down after doing that one sacrifice because it's enough it has finished covering everything which is what is explained over there in that verse in hebrews 10 um verse um 12 he says uh, but when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice one sacrifice for sins he sat down at the right hand of god verse 14 it explains for because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy so that one sacrifice was enough to declare all his followers his true followers as perfect so therefore at the time of salvation when we make our personal commitment to the lord jesus not only are our past sins forgiven even all our future sins are also forgiven the so you know you, you don't have to worry whether the sins which you are going to commit in 2025 are covered or not those are also covered i mean 2025 has not even come yet but those sins which you are going to commit in the future those are also covered so imagine what a great gift was given to us not only are your past sins forgiven even the future sins which you have not even committed yet those are also have been forgiven it's the most amazing free gift a person can ever receive the best gift anyone can receive so this is what justification is all about where god looks at you and he says now onwards you are perfectly righteous you have been made perfect forever and so even your future sins have been uh, forgiven so does this mean that now i can go and live in any way i feel like living no i mean all my sins are forgiven even my future sins are, are forgiven so does this give me the freedom to go and live however i want which is what a lot of people are doing i mean you know we hear these painful stories of important uh, spiritual leaders pastors you know who are living in sin why are they living in sin so confidently because they you know their future sins also have been forgiven so they think why not no take advantage of that let's live in this sinful way but is that what the bible teaches what does it say does it say we can kind of we can start living in sin because you know we have now been forgiven completely do does that give us the right to to live in sin this is what romans chapter 6 verses 15 to 18 this is what it says so romans chapter 6 verses 15 to 18 if someone can read out what then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace certainly not do you not know 
that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God, be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that from of that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. A very basic fundamental principle which Paul is bringing out over here, he says, whomever you choose to obey, that person is going to be your master and you are going to be that person's slave. So if you choose to be slaves of righteousness, then your master is Jesus Christ. On the other hand, if you want to continue, if you want to go back and give yourself uh, to, to sin, then you will be the slave of sin. You know, so whomever you obey, which is what he says in Romans chapter 6, verse um, 16. He says, you are slaves of the one you obey. So which is why he tells in verse 18 to these Romans, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness because these guys made a conscious choice. He says in verse 17, you have come to obey from your heart. From your heart you have chosen to obey the pattern of teaching which has been taught by Jesus, he says, and th that has now claimed your allegiance. It's like as if they formally you know, stood and you know, placed their hand on their heart and said, now onwards we, we you know, uh, give our allegiance to Jesus Christ that we will follow him and his teaching. So it's like as if they have formally taken a vow and they chose to become slaves of righteousness. Therefore, their master is Jesus and they are under his covering. They are under his uh, protection. Um, but... We, are, we also are aware of the fact that even though we have made our allegiance to Jesus, sometimes we still end up sinning. Why? We talked about this in one of our earlier classes. Because our mind is still unrenewed. Our body is still habituated, used to the old sinful lifestyle. So these have not become a new creation in that moment of salvation. So because of that, sometimes we still fall into sin. So, which is why Hebrews 10, 14 puts it in a very clear way, explaining to us exactly what our status is. You no, know, uh, we've read that out already, but then you know, if we could read it out once again, Hebrews 10, verse 14. For by one offering, he has perfected forever mm. those who are being sanctified. Yes, he has made perfect forever. So your spiritual status is that you are now perfectly righteous. Why? Because you are now a new living uh, spirit being. You are no longer an, uh, the sinful fallen spirit being. That sinful fallen spirit being was crucified, killed. You were reborn as a new living uh, spirit. So obviously you are made perfect. You are perfectly righteous. That is what the Holy Spirit has rebirthed you as. But when it comes to your mind and body, you're still going through the sanctification process, which is why it says in the second part of that verse, for by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy on a daily basis. We're being sanctified. So our mind and our body is getting sanctified on a daily basis. So when we sin, what should be our attitude? What should we do when we fall into sin? First John 1 verses 8 to 9. Yeah, so very, very familiar verses. If someone could read out. First John 1, 8 to 9. First John chapter 1 verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in the time of John, you know, who wrote his gospel and his epistles a little later, the other three gospels were written very, very early, uh, maybe within uh, 60, 70 years of Jesus' resurrection. Those gospels were finished, you know, I mean, they, were, they were written off by that time. 
John, on the other hand, wrote a little later. So by then, a lot of wrong teachings had started to creep into the church. So at that time, some people were saying, oh, Christ has now forgiven us all our sins, so now we are perfect. So even if I do something sinful, it's not a sin anymore. Because, you know, I have been made perfect. So that is why John says in his letter, um, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. So don't deceive yourselves and think that you have, you know, in your mind and body, you have become perfect already. No, you're still undergoing the sanctification process. So don't deceive yourself and pretend that you are not sinning. When you sin, humbly come to the Lord, confess openly and say, yes, Lord, what I have done is sinful. Please forgive me. Please help me not to repeat it. So when we come to him humbly and we admit that we have sinned, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. So he will forgive us. In what, why is he faithful and just? It goes on to explain in the next chapter. Like I had said in one of the earlier classes, they, the people who did the division of the letters into different chapters and verses sometimes cut, cut off the chapter at the wrong point. So let's move into First John chapter 2 and also look at verses 1 and 2. Uh, what does it say over there? First John 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for us only, but also for the whole world. That word that is used over there about what Jesus did, it says that he is the propitiation for our sins. In the NIV, it says he's the atoning sacrifice. That word propitiation, that word atoning, other synonyms can be appeasing, satisfying. Basically, that word is saying God was very, very angry, highly displeased with, with us because we were fallen, sinful spirit beings. We were enemies of God. But now, after Christ made the sacrifice and washed us clean, now he has satisfied God. He has appeased God. He has atoned for us. He has propitiated for us, uh, you know, um, uh, and gained us God's approval. So that word basically has uh, that kind of a connotation. So now God is at peace with us because of what Jesus did. So, because of what Jesus, the righteous one, has done, therefore, when we confess our sins, God is faithful. He will remember, oh, Jesus has finished making the propitiatory sacrifice for this person. So, therefore, I will forgive this person. So, when I go to God and say, Lord, I'm so sorry, I, I have sinned against you, and Lord, I do not want to repeat this sin, please forgive me. When we go with that, you know, honest, genuine repentance, he is faithful. He remembers what Jesus did for us. That propitiatory sacrifice which he performed for us, God remembers it and he says, all right, because of what Jesus has done, I will forgive this person. And it says that he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So this unrighteousness, which is still there in my mind, in my body, which is making me do this, he starts cleaning me from that so that I will not repeat it again and again. He starts sanctifying me. He starts purifying me because I went to him with a humble attitude. I was not like those, you know, those strong um, um, believers in the church who were saying, I'm without sin, but I have humbly admitted that I did commit a sin. And because I have been humble, the Lord will not only forgive me, he will start purifying me from that unrighteousness. So this is the beautiful thing which God will do for us because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, the righteous one. Okay, so this is what God has given us. We have been declared completely righteous. And if we fall into sin, he is there to forgive, to purify. He will not turn away from us. Which is why you know it says in Romans chapter um, eight. Now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So rather than pushing us away, disgusted and saying, "Go get lost," I don't want to have anything more to do with you. No, 
there is no condemnation if we can just go to him and confess he will lovingly accept us because of what jesus did this is the great hope that we have so we understand the privilege which has been given to us and we make a conscious choice to stay in union with him the sponge is so grateful for what the bucket has done it chooses to continue staying in the bucket okay so we do not go back into sin we don't go back and say i am bored of my own new master i don't want my new master i think i want the old one so we don't do that we are not the people who who make that wrong choice and say i want to go back under my old master so you see we always have that freedom anyone who really wants to say that can actually do that because god does not take away our free will but however it will be very very difficult to go back to the old master because our new master is very possessive about us okay so we will get get to that we will look at that um let's first look at the negative side and then we will look at the positive side uh, of how extremely difficult it is to lose your salvation because the god whom we have is greater than he who is in the world and is very possessive about us is not going to let go of us but there is a warning given in hebrew so we should look at that warning and take that warning to our hearts and be confident that our lord will not let go of us okay so let's look at the negative side first then we will look at the positive side uh, so um if someone could read out second timothy chapter 4 verse 10 where it talks about this man demas you might have heard about him in in a lot of sermons second timothy 4 verse 10 second timothy chapter 4 verse 10 for demas has forsaken me having loved this present world and has departed to for thessalonica uh, yeah 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 just um, uh, that first portion because they they don't seem to have anything against the other two guys but you know everyone says that demas is a very bad person they say that maybe this verse is saying that he actually left jesus christ and went back into the world and lost his salvation so this is just a a theory which some people propose so a lot in lot of places they say like demas who went back into the world and lost his salvation is what they say now we don't really know okay there's just one single sentence given over there maybe that guy had just backslidden maybe he didn't really go back into the world and accept the old master maybe he had just got backslidden maybe who knows maybe 3 years after this letter was written maybe you know he he repented and came back to jesus so we don't really know the details so let's not just say that demas is the it's one example of somebody who lost their salvation there aren't enough details mentioned over there for us to come to that conclusion yeah the teaching of uh, one saved saved forever is true or false yeah so can salvation be lost or once you're saved you're saved forever and ever uh what should we say regarding that we cannot say anything in 2 minutes it's utterly impossible but yes next class we will be continuing with the doctrine of salvation justification we'll also add a little bit of redemption and sanctification because in your notes you have those four things mentioned so we will touch upon all the four uh, you know concepts which we need to cover but for today we are you know out of time we kind of you know stopped at a very um, um, i don't know very um tense point where we don't know whether demas has lost his salvation or not so yes let's you know look at this you know in our next class so today we looked at how justification applies to us god has declared us perfectly righteous so can a person who has been declared perfectly righteous lose their salvation or not because demas was somebody in full time ministry this was a man who was uh, doing ministry along with paul shoulder to shoulder this was a true believer and this man goes back into the world and we don't really know whether it was just a case of backsliding or whether he had taken a permanent decision we will get to that i know we uh, so we will leave him aside but we will look at this whole idea of whether salvation can be lost or not and we will look at the hebrew passages and we will look at all the other beautiful passages which talk about how god is very possessive about us and will not let go all right so let's close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much for the things that we could learn about 
uh, salvation and justification in our class today. What an amazing, free, generous gift you have given us, O oh Lord. When we come to you, we can have that full assurance that there is now no more condemnation. We are yours and you have, through Christ, perfected us. So we can have the assurance that even though we may fall, we can get back up again. You are on our side. You will forgive us. You will help us to, uh, to grow once more. So we thank you for this deep love that we have, O oh Lord, and this deep assurance that you have given us. We thank you for that. Help us to live in a way which is worthy of you, O oh Lord, and worthy of this beautiful free gift which you have given us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.